Hello, my name is Chris Somerville. I'm a um, director of an institution called Carnegie Institution at Stanford University and a professor at Stanford. I'm also a scientist at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. And today I'm going to talk about uh, the, the argument for biofuels. Uh, in, in brief, I'm going to first describe why I and a number of other people have recently become interested in the possibility of obtaining significant amounts of, of uh, our energy needs through biofuels. And then I'm going to briefly describe some of the technical issues associated with realizing that vision. This, this slide shows uh, where humans currently get in, uh, all our energy. Uh, we use about 13 terawatts each year, and a terawatt is 10 to the 12 watts. Um, the red bars uh, on, on that side show that we get about 85% of our energy from uh, oil, coal, and gas. Um, Additionally, we get about 10% from biomass, that's mostly in the developing world where wood mostly is used, and we get uh, a significant amount from nuclear. Uh, so because we're mostly dependent on fossil fuels, and uh, of course the way we use fossil fuels is to burn them, the burning releases CO2 into the atmosphere, atmospheric CO2 concentration has been increasing uh, during the last century, and that in turn has recently been shown to be associated with a, an increase in global mean temperature. And this is a, not unexpected. Arrhenius, the famous uh, chemist uh, of the previous century, predicted in 1895 that, uh, from first principles, that uh, increasing the CO2 concentration would be associated with, uh, or could be associated with, uh, increased uh, uh, thermal loading, because CO2 is a strong infrared absorber. Uh, the amount of CO2 being released into the atmosphere is, is projected to increase quite strongly during the coming um, years because, as shown on this slide, there's a relationship between energy use or CO2 released per capita and uh, per capita income. So this slide is a, or this graph uh, shows on a log-log scale uh, that, for example, uh, in the developed world, such as the United States, we're releasing, the average person is releasing about 7,000 kilograms of CO2 per year and that's associated with a, a, a certain degree of uh, uh, um, average uh, income. Whereas a country such as China, shown over here, uh, they are releasing less CO2 per capita, but, th but they also have a lower income. And of course, during the coming years, it's expected that their economy and the economy of China and other developing countries will increase strongly, and therefore their CO2 emissions will increase strongly. So as a result, uh, uh, there's been broad interest in modeling uh, what this uh, projected increase in CO2 emissions will do to the climate. This slide shows a, a, a simulation of, uh, by the Hadley Center in England uh, of what's expected to happen as a result of carbon forcing of the climate or increased CO2 concentrations in the climate during the next century. And you can see that by 2100 they're projecting as much as a, a three degree increase in mean annual temperature. Uh, it's generally thought that that will be, uh, uh, in most regions of the world, uh, deleterious because uh, the changes in temperature will alter the flow, for example, of water around the world, rainfall patterns. And changes in rainfall patterns may be very deleterious because it'll make it difficult to grow enough food to um, um, feed people in many regions of the world. Additionally, of course, uh, as other commentators have noted there are many other changes associated with this such as uh, melting of, of uh, ice packs that could uh, decrease flow of water and, uh, and other environmental effects. Therefore there's broad interest in the possibility of, of finding carbon-free or carbon-neutral energy sources. And this slide shows most of the conceivable uh, sources to um, including nuclear. So uh, on the far side, I, I have a kind of a, uh, just a, an icon of nuclear because one of the ways that I, I like to think about the challenge here is, is the following, that the current rate of increase in energy use worldwide is about half a gigawatt, that is half a billion watts per day, and the average nuclear power plant will produce about one gigawatt of energy. So one way of thinking about the problem is that in order to just keep carbon emissions where they currently are, we would need to build a new nuclear power plant every two days for the next 50 years. Uh, that's very challenging. Uh, so certainly, although nuclear may be a part of the long-term solution, we need to look at what the other possibilities are. This slide shows that hydro, for example, over here on the lower uh, corner, 
has mostly been utilized. There is a small amount of capability. There's, uh, we could get about two terawatts around the world from uh, tides and currents, theoretically. Um, and that's a calculation done by the Department of Energy uh, in, a, in a study uh, um, published several years ago. Similarly, we could get about four terawatts uh, by using wind, although currently we, we use very little of that. Uh, we could get quite a lot. Uh, we could get about almost all our needs in principle from geothermal. But the problem with geothermal is that most of the uh, regions where geothermal is available, such as uh, Yellowstone National Park or Iceland or New Zealand, where there's kind of volcanic activity, are not accessible to the big population centers and it's hard to transmit that, that energy to the population centers. So uh, although each of these uh, carbon neutral or uh, sources is, uh, has some role to play, uh, the really big opportunity is solar. And you can see on this scale, solar is off scale. So I'm gonna to go to the next slide and put everything on a log scale. And now what you can see from this is that uh, solar uh, dwarfs all the other possibilities. And that, the reason for that is that we receive each year about 10,000 times as much energy from the sun as all human energy needs. Uh, so um, if we go to the next slide, when one thinks uh, uh, of solar, the inevitably people uh, think that means photovoltaic or photovoltaics or solar cells. And indeed, photovoltaics are an important technology, um, uh, uh, but it's, it's somewhat uh, old technology. Einstein got the Nobel Prize for the photoelectric effect in 1923. And today, since that time, uh, only three square kilometers of photovoltaics have been manufactured in the whole history of the planet. To put that in perspective, just to meet U.S. energy needs, we would need about 26,000 uh, square kilometers of photovoltaics to meet our energy needs. So there's a pretty big gap between all what we've been able to do so far and, and our needs. And in fact, the, the black square over on one side of the United States shows the size of that photovoltaic uh, if it was all in one piece. In fact, if we covered every roof in America with photovoltaics, we could get about 7% of our energy. So although that's good, uh, I don't think that it's practical to rely on photovoltaics as the only way of harvesting uh, solar in the foreseeable future. I, I, before I go on to biofuels, I do want to mention one other technology that's, uh, that I think is going to be important and, and is now under study. And that is the idea that, that uh, we may be able to continue using fossil fuels on a fairly large scale as long as we remove the CO2 from combustion. And so, the opportunity here is to uh, is kind of illustrated in this slide in which one can imagine that, for example, in large electricity generating plants, it may be possible to strip the CO2 out of the smokestack and then pump it back into something like a, 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 a subterranean aquifer or perhaps uh, old gas and oil fields. And uh, the questions that are under study here are the degree to which it's possi possible to do that economically, but also the degree to which it's possible to keep the CO2 underground. And in fact, worldwide, there are about three uh, big experiments going on. This is an illustration of one of them called the Sleipner experiment, which is in the North Sea. In this particular experiment, uh, there, there's a gas well where they're, they're bringing gas up from a deep gas well, and then they're stripping CO2 that's contaminating the gas and pumping it back into an aquifer at about 1,000 meters. And so far, this experiment suggests that uh, this kind of sequestration in saline aquifers can be a promising approach. However, uh, in, in this particular site, they're putting a million tons a year into the aquifer, just to give you a sense of the magnitude of it. But um, we would need 7,000 such sites to decarbonize our fossil fuels. And while that's possible, in theory, uh, I think a lot more work is going to be required before we know whether that's really practical on a large scale. It may be that on a regional scale, it, it may be part of the solution. Um, an important part of that, if I, is to just mention that uh, it's also possible when uh, converting fossil fuels to, instead of just burning them on the spot, it's possible to strip hydrogen from the fossil fuels and also sequester the CO2. So much of the discussion that took place in the last several years about the so-called hydrogen economy is mostly associated with that idea, which is that it may be possible to reform fossil fuels where we remove the hydrogen, sequester the CO2, and then use the hydrogen as a fuel. So there are a number of possibilities, and the one I really want to focus on, however, is 
uh, the, the solar opportunity using plants rather than some sort of mechanical device as, as a, um, a solar collector. So the, the basic story um, in higher plants is shown here, and that is that uh, sunlight is, of course, received by plants through photosynthesis. And, and during photosynthesis, plants take uh, energy, photons from sunlight. They uh, reduce carbon dioxide and make polysaccharides. Um, so higher plants, as I'll show in a few moments, are mostly composed of polysaccharides. And then, of course, those polysaccharides can be burned to produce work, and the combustion releases CO2. So the, the CO2 cycles around. Uh, and, and in that respect, fuels made from plants can be considered carbon neutral. The question that arises, of course, and the most important question is, is there enough land to produce a significant amount of biofuels? There is a sense that somehow we need the land for food or for uh, other purposes. And while that's true, uh, I think that uh, there is enough land to make a substantial amount of fuel. And the argument is as follows. Uh, one can look at the planet, as shown in this pie chart, as about 70% water and 30% land. We're getting about 90,000 terawatts of energy from the sun. So if we could just capture 1% of that uh, on the land, uh, we would need about 5% of the land at 1% efficiency to meet all human energy needs. Now, 1% uh, uh, is feasible. This slide shows a, a, a plant called Miscanthus giganteus uh, growing on the University of Illinois campus. Uh, there's a student named Emily Heaton standing in front of it to give you a sense of how big it is. It's standing about 14 feet tall. And this plant uh, is a perennial grass that's been growing on the University of Illinois campus for, for some years. And the amount of biomass that accumulates above ground during the annual growing season is, uh, represents more than 1% solar uh, efficiency. That is, the plants are receiving um, uh, enough energy and storing it in the form of polysaccharides that uh, it's a 1% efficient. So I believe that it is possible from first principles to ob ob um, obtain enough energy. Uh, this slide actually shows uh, how all land is used on the planet. And what it shows is that uh, we have about 7% in non-cereals and about 5% uh, of the land used in cereals. So altogether, we use about 12% of the surface of the earth for food production, ignoring uh, pasture and rangeland. Therefore, uh, for first principles, it seems possible that we might be able to afford a few percent for energy production, although that needs to be studied in, in more detail. Uh, but I thought that would be, at a, at a high level of uh, uh, viewpoint, that would be my argument as to why there may be enough land. Another uh, important factor in considering the land question is shown here. And, and, uh, of course, population has expanded very strongly and will continue to expand very strongly for the next three years. We, we added about three billion people to the planet during the last 50 years, and we are expected to add about three billion more during the next 50 years. So we're certainly uh, going to need to feed these people. Uh, and what this slide shows is something very fascinating. So what the red line shows is the amount of the land used to produce cereals, which are the main staple, and by cereals I mean rice and wheat and corn and things like that. Uh, and you can see that in the early 60s, we were using about 600 million hectares. A hectare is about, about two and a half acres. Um, and, and if we were still using the same cultivars of cereals today as in the 1960s, today we'd be using about 1.6 billion hectares of land for cereals. Uh, but because plant breeders and agronomists have made improvements in the productivity of our plants. You can see that today, actually, we're still only using about 600 million hectares worldwide. So the plant breeders and agronomists have saved about, about a billion hectares of land uh, from cereal production. And uh, that process needs to continue as we go forward so that we can continue to feed people. Uh, but it also, I think, conveys something very interesting about the importance of basic research on plant productivity is that if you care about the environment, one of the really largest uh, effects you can have is to contribute to our continued ability to increase plant productivity in, in a sustainable way. Uh, and I, uh, so uh, this, will be, this will be true broadly in terms of biofuels as well. That is, all land use is fungible, so uh, knowledge about plants can be used to make food or it can be used to make fuels now. And um, so I think the imperative for understanding plant biology has gotten more important. Now, uh, another way of looking at the problem as to whether there's enough land is shown here, although 
this just deals with the U.S. situation. Uh, in, 19, or in 2005, uh, the Department of Energy and the U.S. Department of Agriculture asked some scientists in, the or in those organizations to analyze what the capability of the United States is to produce biofuels. And this pie chart shows the results of their study in which they, they went sort of county by county around the United States and they analyzed land use and productivity. And they concluded that uh, in the United States we could produce about 1.3 billion dry tons of uh, plant biomass that's excess to all our other needs. And this would not in include any uh, invasion of the national forests or uh, anything that was considered environmentally uh, de destructive or any change in our ability to produce food. To put that in perspective, 1.3 billion dry tons can theoretically be converted to about 130 billion gallons of ethanol using projected uh, technical improvements that I'll talk about later. Uh, and to put that in perspective, we currently use about uh, 140 billion gallons of gasoline. So on a gallon for gallon basis, uh, this study would suggest that just with uh, existing excess uh, biomass productivity in the United States, we could produce almost all, about two thirds in fact, of our, of our energy needs. Uh, as you can see the, the, uh, from, the, from the pie chart, the sources of the, of, uh, the projected biomass vary a bit. So for example, uh, it was projected that corn stover, uh, meaning the stalks and leaves of corn plants, could produce about 20% of that. We have about uh, 90 million acres of corn and uh, we could get about three and a half tons per acre of, of corn stalks. Uh, additionally, we actually pay farmers uh, you can see down here in the so-called uh, the, the orange zone, we pay farmers not to farm about 36 million acres in the so-called uh, CRP lands and, and in theory these lands could be brought into production for uh, production of perennial grasses that could contribute um, a certain amount as well. So by this analysis also it seems as though there's enough land to uh, meet many of our needs. Now. While I applaud the DOE study and the USDA study, uh, I, I think that it, in the long run uh, we may not end up using crop residues because in many cases the cost of collecting them, because they're, they're not very, uh, there's not a very large amount per acre, the cost of collecting them and processing them may not um, uh, be worthwhile. And I think it's likely that in the long run, because land use is fungible, we're going to evolve towards the use of a new type of crop, which I'm going to call an energy crop, a highly productive plant species that can be grown specifically for energy production. And one of the reasons for this, and, and furthermore, these, these crops are going to be, I believe, mostly perennial uh, grasses, C4 grasses, as we call it. So C4 refers to a type of photosynthesis that makes uh, very efficient use of water. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. This slide shows one of, the ra one of the reasons that we're interested in perennial crops as opposed to annuals. So you can see that the blue line here shows the uh, sort of the annual photosynthesis rate of corn during the, during the cycle, during the uh, year. And, and uh, what, you, what, you, what you observe by looking at it is that uh, in the beginning of the spring the corn the seedlings come up and they begin photosynthesizing and then as the crop fills out the, the uh, field uh, the photosynthesis rate peaks and then the crop starts to decline as, the, as, the, as it senesces. Uh, the yellow lines show the same cycle, the, photosynthetic, uh, the annual photosynthetic cycle for uh, uh, two perennial crops, Miscanthus and Spartina. And you can see that the area under the curve of, this, of the perennials is much higher than the area under the curve for the annual. And that's because the perennial grasses uh, start the year off from a, a large root that overwinters in the soil and that root is full of nutrients that stimulate rapid growth of the, uh, of the plant at the beginning of the, of the annual cycle. So um, you can see just by, by looking at the area under these curves that uh, these perennial grasses can be much more productive per acre than, a, than any annual crop. So uh, I've introduced miscanthus once before and I just want to say this, this is a good example of a, of a perennial uh, C4 grass. This plant is, uh, has been cut every year for the last seven years at the ground and, uh, and the biomass removed and processed. Uh, no, no irrigation is required in this particular case. No fertilizer has yet been applied to it. And so uh, in general terms, the input costs of producing this are quite low. There's also no runoff uh, because um, 
uh, it's not fertilized and, and it has an immense root system that captures uh, any nutrients. Additionally, because this plant is usually harvested at the end of the cycle, as I'll show in a moment, um, uh, it supports wildlife during the year, so it's generally considered environmentally attractive. Another species that's much talked about as a dedicated energy crop is switchgrass, shown here. And um, um, switchgrass is not quite as, as big and impressive as uh, miscanthus, um, but um, uh, in certain uh, regions it may be preferable because uh, plants, of course, the growth of plants responds to uh, temperature, climate, and, um, uh, and water availability. Uh, so uh, these are two examples. They're both C4 grasses, and they both make efficient use of, of water. As I mentioned uh, a few moments ago, it's envisioned that these plants will be uh, left standing throughout the year. And, uh, and, and in the winter, you can see there's actually snow on the ground here when this, this miscanthus crop is being harvested. Uh, they can be harvested at this time of year. And, and one of the advantages of this late season, at least late season harvesting is that uh, uh, these perennial grasses have a tendency to withdraw their mineral nutrients out of the vegetative parts of the plant and store it back in the roots. And uh, th that's very attractive for sustainability because uh, it means that the nutrients are recycled each year and the harvesting of the biomass to produce fuels doesn't remove nutrients or it removes fewer nutrients uh, from, the, from the field than with an annual crop which doesn't go through this annual cycle of withdrawing the nutrients back into the roots. It's one of the arguments, another argument for using perennials. So I believe that during the next 25 years or so, we may see some uh, new crops appear. And indeed, this, is a, this uh, image of the U.S. is from a, a Department of Energy study and uh, showing that in different zones of the U.S., uh, some new crops may appear. So for example, down here in the green zone, you see things like miscanthus and switchgrass, hybrid poplars, whereas up in the northern regions where it's a bit colder and uh, the terrain is different, there are things such as uh, willows may be used as an uh, as a, as a energy crop. They can be cut each year at ground level and they'll regrow. Now, the main limitation to where these crops are going to be grown is, is actually shown here. This is a, a rainfall map of the United States. And uh, what it shows is that actually over here on the, uh, uh, on the left-hand side is the um, uh, the, the colors indicate that there's very little uh, water, whereas all the green regions show where the rainfall uh, occurs. And so, in general terms, uh, it's likely that the biomass crops are going to be grown here in, in the uh, east of the Mississippi, where there's adequate rainfall. This is also true globally. So, uh, on this particular image of the world, uh, uh, the, the regions that are colored blue are regions where it's too, co too cold to get large amounts of biomass. The regions where it's red, it's too dry. And so you can see, for example, the Amazon basin uh, and parts of Argentina, also the US Midwest, have adequate rainfall to produce uh, large amounts of plants. Similarly, uh, on this, the, if we look at the rest of the world, you can see there are regions of Africa, China, or Southeast Asia, and Europe have adequate amounts of uh, rainfall and temperature, whereas unfortunately uh, much of uh, uh, the former Soviet Union uh, is a bit too cold. So if I were to summarize what I've tried to say during the last few minutes, um, I think I, I've mentioned most of these points, but I would like to just re reiterate that uh, I think we're moving towards a situation where we're going to develop perennial grasses or and other perennial plants as uh, energy crops and that these will be more environmentally benign than field crops. Um, they have low uh, fertilizer and chemical inputs, delayed harvest supports uh, biodiversity. Uh, something I didn't mention yet, but uh, unlike field crops, which are generally one genotype, we envision that the perennial uh, energy crops will be certainly mixed genotypes so that the uh, pa pest and pathogen pressures don't build up. That is, if you only have one genetic type in a field, uh, um, uh, pests and pathogens will get specialized on it and could be very destructive. So we'll certainly have mixed genotypes with regard to disease and, and pest resistance and possibly even mixed species uh, to um, uh, decrease those pressures. Indeed, uh, the work of uh, uh, an ecologist named David Tillman has emphasized uh, the importance of, of mixed species in grassland productivity. And uh, I think we don't really know yet what the 
what the species that will actually be used are. There's interest in many species. I showed two that are of uh, high interest right now, but there are many more very highly productive species that have not really been investigated in the past because they weren't useful as uh, for food products. So this is an emerging area that I think will be quite interesting. I think a, a big issue is going to be to make sure that these plants can be grown and harvested year after year in a sustainable way. There's not a lot of information on this. Uh, however, this slide shows that at least in the case of corn, there are concerns. So this is some unpublished data from a USDA scientist named Ken Vogel. And what Ken is showing in this slide is that, uh, is that in the year 2000, where his experiment started, he began removing half of the corn stalks from a, from a cornfield and leaving the other half in the soil. And you can see that actually by year two or three after that, the, the yield of uh, the corn was declining relative to the controls where they left all the corn stalks on the land. And the thinking about the, the, the rationale or the explanation for this is that uh, Ken thinks that the corn stalks are required to uh, support microbial diversity in the soil or to support microbial processes, I should say more, more generally, and that those are required to, uh, for correct nutrient flow in the soils. So this is now an area of active study. Uh, experiments that are being carried out are things such as taking soil samples from crops that have been harvested in different ways with different amounts of uh, biomass left on the field and then analyzing the species composition in the soil by, for example, sequencing all the organisms present and to it so that they can be identified based on their DNA sequence. Uh, I think another area that, that's going to need a lot of work, uh, I alluded to it earlier, is that uh, pests and pathogens can be very devastating. Uh, we don't really know yet since no energy crops, dedicated energy crops have been grown on a large scale. Um, whether or the degree to which they'll be susceptible to pests and pathogens. This slide is showing uh, a, um, a soybean field that's being devastated. As you can see, and the, there's, there's a lot of sort of yellowish uh, plants here uh, being devastated by a new pathogen that was, uh, has arrived in the United States called uh, Asian soy rust. Um, so this is a continuing problem. There's, in agriculture and forestry, there's a continuing battle between uh, production of the plants and uh, the pests and pathogens that tend to specialize on as the acreage increases. Um, I think the, the, there are many questions associated with this. This is a, the whole area of biofuels has been under investigation for, oh, 30 years really, ever since the first oil shocks of the 1970s, but in a fairly low way. Uh, and so now that there's renewed interest, um, uh, there's a lot of un unanswered questions. Among those that typically come up uh, in, in discussions are, what are the probable effects on food security? Um, it, it's certainly true that in some regions of the world, uh, people have difficulty feeding themselves and they're dependent on food exports from the developed world. Uh, I don't know the answer to that, and, and I and colleagues in, uh, are, are just beginning to really try and understand those effects. It's possible, for example, that, that actually it's the exports of food from the developing world that are the source of the food production problems elsewhere in the world. That is, because the United States and Europe heavily subsidize agriculture, uh, we're able to sell grain around the world or, or even give it away below the cost of production. And that may suppress the formation of, of indigenous agricultural production systems. That needs to be understood. Uh, there's concern whether there will be trade-offs and environmental effects. For example, uh, do we need to, in order to expand the amount of land available for biofuels, will that lead to uh, destruction of important uh, ecological zones, deforestation? And indeed, there are examples where that's taken place. For example, um, during the past several years, the European Union has mandated that uh, fuels in Europe require uh, a certain percentage of biodiesel. Unfortunately, Europe cannot produce enough um, oils, biological oils or fats to, to meet that, so they uh, have been importing palm oil, and that in turn has led to expansion of, of tropical oil palm elsewhere in the world, in Malaysia, leading to deforestation, which is an undesirable uh, effect. So I think that uh, although there's some promise, and, and from first principles, it seems that there is enough land, 
we need really to look at, at, around, at the global situation and make sure that demand for biofuels in the developed world doesn't lead to undesirable ecological or even social effects uh, in other regions of the world. Uh, for example, when I mention social effects, um, you know, land ownership is not equitable in many regions of the world, and it could be that uh, large landowners may decide to, to devote their land to the production of, of biofuels at the expense of food production in those countries. Uh, so one of the ways of dealing with that can be to have international trade policies that discourage that kind of activity uh, that is essentially restricting the market uh, for, uh, uh, for, for biofuels from certain regions uh, where um, uh, land use is not equitable. Um, I think uh, these are just a few examples of the issues before us. Uh, I think they illustrate the fact that uh, as with any large change such as is anticipated with the, the uh, production of uh, biofuels on a large scale, there are many issues that need to be uh, discovered across a, a range of scientific and non-scientific disciplines. So uh, social studies and economics are now need to be integrated with our technical vision of what's possible uh, before we actually engage in a large-scale activity. Um, uh, as I'm going to say in, my, in the next s segment of this uh, series, uh, the, since there are a number of technical issues that are preventing the uh, adoption of large-scale biofuels today, I think we have time to think through what the issues are and to, um, and to implement appropriate um, regulatory and uh, trade policies. So uh, from first principles, or I've tried to illustrate sort of the, what I see as the, the possible future in terms of biofuels, this slide sort of illustrates a situation in which we can imagine uh, sustainable production of, of uh, cellulosic uh, biomass or other types of biomass being processed and uh, recycled uh, so that we, we do move towards uh, a world in which um, we're able to produce uh, energy on a, in a sustainable way. Having said that, I, I do want to emphasize that the, although I, I said earlier we could probably produce all human energy needs from, um, um, from biological sources, uh, the, the, the goals of everybody that I know of, including the Secretary of Energy that are currently working in this field, are to merely try and substitute for a significant part of our transportation fuels. The transportation fuels are the most difficult ones because they're used in relatively small amounts uh, in, in a highly distributed uh, system. It seems likely that, for example, we can meet our electricity needs or any, any kind of uh, needs that can be met with electricity can be dealt with through photovoltaics or wind or to some extent hydro, nuclear and sequestration from uh, fossil fuel utilization. Uh, so the, the main target right now is, is uh, biofuels and indeed the, the Secretary of Energy's goals of the United States is that we will uh, obtain 30% of our transportation fuels from biofuels by 2030. So that gives you some sense of the time frame in which we expect these transitions to take place. 